Hello, everyone. Just want to give everyone a few seconds to kind of sign on. Okay, um, and obviously we have a very special guest here who I'm going to introduce in just a moment. I just know, you know, people take a little bit to click and actually get on the live. Okay, awesome. So I guess we'll go ahead and actually get started. Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, obviously you see I am joined here by a very special person. I am Arielle, I am the arts engagement producer for um, The Artery at WBUR. We are the arts and culture team. And I am joined tonight by Ya Jesse. And um, I'm hoping that if you're tuning in, you already know who she is and you're already familiar with some of her amazing work, but just because I have to do my due diligence, I'm going to say her bio. So Ya was born in Ghana and raised in Huntsville, Alabama. She holds a BA in English from Stanford University and an MFA from the Ira Writers Workshop, where she held a Dean's Graduate Research Fellowship, and she is currently calling in from Brooklyn. Ya, how are you? Hi, Ariel. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing very well excited to have this conversation. Yes, me too. I have been a huge fan for years, as are, I'm sure, a ton of people who are watching right now. Um, so today, um, as much as I think we probably are going to want to talk about um, homegoing, um, we really are going to talk about Yas newest book that actually just published yesterday called Transcendent Kingdom. Um, and actually, if you're looking to grab your own copy of the book, Porter Square Books is offering 20% um, off because um, they are partnering with WBR City Space to put on this event. And um, basically, you just have to go um, and put in your order there. And there are a variety of shipping and pickup options available for you. And Ya has also kindly signed um, some of these books. So if you want one, make sure that you leave a note in your order comment. And your signed book, if you want one, will be available early next week. But obviously, 20% off. Y'all should get on that ASAP, right? <laughs> um, moving on to you guys, everybody watching. Obviously, we want um, you to participate and ask questions. Um, we're very honored to have y'all here tonight. So, you know, make sure you've got like some good questions for us. If you want to submit them, you can go to slido.com and use the event code Jesse. So G-Y-A-S-I. Um, we've already gotten some great questions and we'll try to get in as many as I can. Um, you know, I'm not a miracle worker. You know, I can't answer every single question and I think the hour that we have, but hopefully we'll get through a good amount of them. You can also go to the YouTube live to chat with other people who are watching live. Finally, if you want to keep updated on amazing events like these, make sure you subscribe to WBUR City Spaces YouTube channel. Um, and basically when you subscribe, you get notified anytime an event like this is happening. And if you click the bell icon, um, you get notified every time that WBUR City Space goes live. Whew, sorry, that was a lot <laughs> <laughs> to run through. But now that that's done, um, yeah, again, like we're very, very excited um, to have you here tonight. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm so um, kind of relieved and excited that the book has finally started to crawl its way out into the world and seeing it in bookstore windows and seeing it in people's hands. And um, that that always feels really amazing. So I'm, I'm good. Right. I'm sure it's surreal. I have my copy here. Um, Beautiful. I have it. Um, the cover is just gorgeous. And after reading it, I think it has kind of like a whole new meaning for me. So like what went into this cover art? You know, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, which is that very few authors get to see the, the process behind the cover. This was the first cover I saw. Um, and when I saw it, I just kind of immediately knew that it was the one. It was so beautiful. Um, I'm sure if I didn't like it, I could go back and and they'd, you know, remix it. But um, but this was it was kind of one and done for me. Right. Um, and obviously, I know a lot of people are here because we loved your debut novel, Homegoing. Um, 
<clears throat> and I think that, you know, obviously this book came out, it was your debut, it got rave reviews, it was this literary darling in so many ways. Um, but Transcendent Kingdom is like quite different from Homegoing. And I think um, both like in structure, obviously in content, there are some similarities, but it's also like a very different book. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe why you decided to do something different with this second novel or maybe why it just kind of happened that way? Um, it definitely felt more as though it just was happening that way. Um, I started writing Transcendent Kingdom um, almost unconsciously I began it. Um, after I finished Homegoing, I wrote this short story about a, a young woman who was a Gerard Manley Hopkins scholar whose mother, who was quite ill, comes to stay with her. Um, and I really, really liked that story. I liked the voice of that story, um, but I, I set it aside. I returned to Homegoing, finished that and sold it and it took off um, and changed my life. And I didn't really think about the story for, for many years. Um, but when I started writing this book, I remembered that voice and I remember that scenario, that of a, of a young woman who is deeply intellectual being confronted with her very religious mother. Um, and I thought that that would be a nice way to kind of launch into something new. Um, so it wasn't really thinking about it as a departure from homegoing per se, um, though I was excited by the opportunity to kind of stretch new muscles um, than the ones that I used for homegoing. You know, this this was a different kind of research. This was first person. Um, it was a single family. It was contemporary, um, just about as different from homegoing as you can get. Um, but I, I relished that kind of challenge again to, to stretch myself and to think about um, think about new questions. Right. And so um, so much of the science in this book parallels, you know, a lot of the research that one of your really good friends was doing at the time on mice. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about um, well, you talk a lot about in this book about these mice, and they seem to serve as like an allegory for a lot of what happens in the novel. So can you talk a little bit about like um, why that research fascinated you? Yeah, um, so my friend uh, from Alabama, I've known her since high school, um, was at the time a PhD candidate in neuroscience, um, and she was working on her final thesis project, which um, I borrow for this character, Gifty, in the novel, so you'll read about it there. But basically, she's working on addiction and depression um, and looking at the neural pathways of what's called reward-seeking behavior. Um, so what she does is she's created this behavioral testing chamber, um, and she trains the mice to press a lever. Um, and when they press the lever, they either get insure, um, which they really like, or they get a mild foot shock, which they really hate. Um, but what fascinated her was that a lot of, not a lot, but some of the mice continued to press the lever even when they, even when they knew that they were gonna get shocked for it. Um, and so she's wondering, why do they do that? Um, and the way she used to explain her research to me was that she was thinking about addiction and depression as existing on this kind of continuum, wherein for people who suffer from addiction, there's this desire to keep seeking reward, even when there's great risk involved. Um, and for people who suffer from depression, there is um, a lack of desire to seek pleasure, to seek reward, um, even when there's great um, opportunity, um, great joy to be found therein. So she's wondering why that's the case. Um, and it's so completely different from anything that I spend my days thinking about. Um, this project really started with me asking if I could shadow her in her lab um, and watching her do surgery on her mice. And, um, and I was just blown away, first of all, by the fact that this person that I know so well had this 
intimate life that had nothing to do with with ha the context that I knew her in. And um, there was something really beautiful about getting to see somebody that you love out of context and see them being really excellent at it. Um, so that that really thrilled me. Um, the research thrilled me. And I thought that there was a way to connect some of the things that she was researching and thinking about with some of my own interests. Um, and again, with that story that I had really liked. Right. And what fascinated me the most, I don't want to spoil too much of it, was uh, was the mouse that developed that limp, right, in like preparation of the punishment. Um, and there's like Gifty has kind of like that realization, like, like like the 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 reward outweighs the punishment for this mouse mm -hmm. like i don't know at that point i felt like so much kind of made sense about like the parallels between the mice and also kind of like um nana's addiction mm -hmm. right yeah yeah exactly i mean um gifty is a character who is She's, you know, she's very buttoned up. She, um, she's very interested in being good and being the best. Um, she tells us frequently that she's doing this work because it's hard and she wants to do something hard. She wants to do the hardest thing she can. Um, but what she doesn't talk about is the emotional aspect of the work, or at least what she doesn't talk about as much is the emotional aspect of the work um, and the fact that really part of the reason that she got into this work was because of her older brother's um, death from an opioid overdose. Um, and it's this, it's this trauma that happens early on in her life that she puts up this wall around. Um, and anytime anyone tries to approach it, she bristles or she backs away. Um, and so she doesn't, she, she doesn't think, or she doesn't always make the connection that the way that she's seeing these mice particularly that limping mouse um, has a lot to do with her relationship to her brother um, and how she viewed his illness. Yes, um, and that kind of brings me to my next point is um, when we start focusing on um, or on the Black Mamba as Gifty calls her mother, um, you know, and her experience with depression, right? Um, and I just got to thinking about like how a lot of black families and communities kind of handle mental illness. Can you talk a little bit about like how these people who, um, you know, obviously she's got the, the mother has, you know, like her, her family at church and then she has her daughter. So um, how do you feel like that kind of parallels the different ways in which mental illness is handled in like black communities? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think that that there's often a not just a stigma around mental illness, but like an unwillingness to approach mental illness um, or to talk about it as openly um, as as sometimes you need to in order to overcome it. Um, and I think for Gifty's family in, in particular, um, for Gifty's mother, a lot of her reticence to deal with or think about um, mental illness is cultural. It comes from a the fact that she um, is from Ghana. Um, she says at some point we don't have we don't have mental mental illness in our country. Um, it's an invention of the West, um, and I think that allows her to kind of to kind of disassociate from what's happening to her. Um, but then the other thing is is her religion is where she finds her comfort, where she finds her strength, um, and so for her when she's feeling sad um, or when she equates her depression with sadness, though it is clearly something more severe than sadness, um, she thinks, well, I'm just gonna take this to God um, and, and let him deal with it. It's, I'm not gonna call it depression, I'm just gonna call it that thing that I need to give to God. Um, and so I think the stigma is about not having the language or having a different kind of language for talking about mental health um, than, than the one that other communities have. Um, and it's about not wanting to appear weak. Um, and it's about wanting to kind of um, deal with things in the way that the community that you live in deals with things. Um, I think it's really, it's multi-layered, um, but it is something that, that creates this impediment for Gifty's mother from seeking out um, help. 
uh, and Gifty, as a scientist who specializes in psychiatric illness, knows what her mother needs or believes that she knows what her mother needs in order to um, get over the hump of this. Um, but she also knows that it's not what her mother wants. Um, and so she's trying to balance that, that need and that want. Mm. And that reminds me of a scene in the book where she goes to the student center when she's um, in her first semester in Boston and she asks for the light, right? Thinking that it was one thing, but not realizing almost that like the, like, I, I don't know if I would necessarily call Gifty like happy throughout mm. this book. Like she doesn't seem happy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's um that that part really struck me because it was almost like she didn't know what she needed, yet she Absolutely. was so um so intent on knowing what her mother needed, you know, yeah. and that I was just like, oh, you're writing. I was just like, <laughs> I felt like there were like all of these Easter eggs throughout. Um, I've only finished like the first half, mm -hmm. um, that are just kind of like littered throughout that you just kind of start to pick up on eventually but that was one of them that yeah was you because that hit me in my heart i was like oh this baby girl oh. thinks you just need a light and it'll get better you know what i mean yeah <laughs> that's one of the pleasures of, of writing this character or thinking about this character is that she's so meticulous and so observant about everyone else um but when it comes to herself and her own needs um, and taking care of her own mental health and making sure that she's got everything that she needs. Um, she really she really just can't see it. She doesn't want to approach it. And so that moment that you're talking about when she walks into the student health center, realizing that she's not happy um, and thinking, okay, I'm just gonna get this lamp, this seasonal affective disorder lamp and stare at it all day and maybe that'll make me feel better. That's like the only, that's the first time that we see her having any kind of um, agency or taking charge of her mental health, um, but even that doesn't help. Um, and then she just kind of lets it go. So she's a character who I think is so used to having to take care of everyone else, particularly take care of her mother, who doesn't really have the capacity to mother gifty. Um, that she that she forgets that you need that you need that from somewhere. You know, if you can't get it from your mother, you still need it from somewhere. And um, that scene where uh, the, I forget the scientific name for the study with the mamas and the babies. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and just how like the mothers kind of just stoically ignoring the children made them like, just felt like, feels like they were just in such a distress because they mm -hmm. felt like they um, couldn't communicate almost like their pain to their mothers. I, um, I mean, I really haven't finished the book yet, and I'm like, I know what I'm hoping happens between <laughs> mother, but I'm not sure it will. So I'm not getting my hopes up. And um, I do want to go here to an audience question because it seems pretty relevant. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, Shose. I'm not, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, this person asked, how important is both female and African representation in your work? Do you deliberately set out to incorporate these aspects of your identity in your writing? Which I think is kind of like a interesting question. We kind of talked about it, but not quite. Um, yes, absolutely. It's hugely important for me and for my work. Um, part of the reason that I wanted to become a writer is that I really firmly believe in that Toni Morrison quote that if you are looking for a book that you want to read, and you can't find it on your shelf, you must write it. Um, and for me, the books that I wasn't finding were about people who had experiences similar to the ones um, that I had. I wasn't reading a lot about the kind of 1.5 generation um, Black immigrant who comes to America really young um, and has to kind of sort out how to think about race and ethnicity. Um, and so I, I hope that all of my work will center around women um, and center around um, Black people. Um, I, I can't imagine writing anything else, really. 
Yes, a beautiful answer, I would say. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of hard to separate like uh, your lived experiences, I think. I think a lot of times people try do it in writing, obviously, but um, I think that actually kind of feeds into like the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is um, racism. And it almost kind of seems to be this uh, kind of like, um, it has this presence in the book but it's almost a little elusive. Like, I feel like we kind of catch snippets here and there, like at the soccer game. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, um, Gifty's dad moves back to Ghana because, you know, um, I think he's, uh, part of it, part of it is he's like living, uh, like the experience of obviously a black man in America where he is the, he is the minority, right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how racism kind of like works its way into this story? Sure. Um, well, for for one, I wanted to play with the notion of the American dream, um, the often unquestioned, unchecked notion of the American dream. Um, and that's where Gifty's father comes in. You know, his, his wife has convinced him to move to America because they will have more opportunity there. They wind up in Alabama and lo and behold, it's awful. He's miserable. He's treated incredibly poorly. And he's thinking, why did I leave my country full of black people for this? Um, and he decides to go to go back. Um, and I think you're right that the that the racism in this book, often um, the moments that I depict are ones that we often call microaggression. But as any black person knows, when you're experiencing those things, they don't feel micro um, and, and they start to wear away at you. And I think they wear away at each character quite differently. Um, for Gifty's mother, who is really stoic, um, but also really secretive and kind of um, and walled, um, she just kind of doesn't think about it. She's like, why, why would I not go to this church that's close to my house? Um, not realizing that there is a very big difference between the way that Black people um, practice evangelicalism and the way that white people practice evangelicalism. Um, and then for Gifty, I think the way that it manifests is in her internalized racism. There are so many moments where she'll say things like, you know, I didn't want to be thought of as a woman in science or as a Black woman in science. And you're thinking, why not? What's up with that, Gifty? And you see these little, these little, these little pieces of her chipping away. Um, I think because of all that she has internalized. Um, but there's never a kind of big bang, flashy moment of racism. It's always these um, quiet, um, but but no less insidious ways that it that people encounter it in their real lives. Mm. And what really interested me, interested me was Nana's reaction to. Um, you know, that soccer game where the parent was, you know, typical, like, you know, like, don't you lose to those, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and he got angry, you know what I mean? Um, and he had like a very visceral reaction to this outburst. Um, and again, it reminded me of the mice and like, what if racism is kind of like, um, that scene where Gifty is like, uh, like attaching that headpiece onto the mouse. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like all of these different reactions in different ways to kind of like um, the same set of stimuli. Mm -hmm. You know. What I mean? um, and like, yeah, those mice. Like, I just really kept thinking, like, let's talk about the mice because mm -hmm. I really like to talk about like um what they symbolize and like what they mean because obviously they're much more than than these mice that that gifty just experiments on yeah yeah um well gifty at some point like she talks about how she views her work with this with these mice as a kind of collaboration she's aware of the fact that everything that she knows about the brain she owes to these creatures um who we think of as being low on the totem pole um, there's a moment when she says something like she had spent all of her life in church being taught that she had dominion over the animals without ever um, learning that she herself was an animal. Um, and so I think that the way that, that Gifty thinks of the mice is that they are 
um, these kind of microcosmic views of what humanity might look like. Uh, and they are a way to approach all of the problems um, that she sees manifesting um, in her in her personal life. So she wants to find a cure for depression and she wants to find a cure for addiction. And she knows that she needs this collaboration with these creatures in order to do so. And so I think for Gifty, they symbolize hope um, and they symbolize um, kind of yeah, just the the opportunity to find the answers to the questions that she has. Um, yeah, totally. And I think you know, obviously, as you said, with without the mice, Gifty wouldn't wouldn't have her work, right? Which is like often her savior um, at so many points throughout the book. I want to go back to what you said about the black church versus the white church. <laughs> I read this in. Um, a review of Transcendent Kingdom that just came out in the New York Times. And that was a question posed in the review. And I was thinking like, yeah, like what if that did happen? Mm. What if she had gone to a black church first? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I think it would have made all of the difference if not for the mother um, who in some ways is really opaque to me, I'm not sure why she didn't realize that that was something that her children might need. Um, so if not for her, then certainly for her children, it would have made a world of difference. Um, Gifty at one point overhears people in her church um, just kind of uh, talking poorly, making racist remarks about her brother uh, and about his illness. And um, she talks about how that moment of overhearing it is this little seed planted um, that kind of starts to grow into, I think, what is her internalized racism, where she's just like, I wanted so desperately to be good. And this was my first time realizing that I would never be good enough um, to, to overcome the things that these people believed about me. Um, I could never, there was nothing I could ever do um, that would make them see me as whole and as human. Uh, and that's a that's a really big thing for a child to bear and certainly not something that a child, I think, can really unpack at that age. Um, she calls it a spiritual wound. Um, and I think she she carries it um, for for, you know, at least the length of this novel, if not longer. Um, but had she gone to a black church, had her mother um, and father realized that that was something that she could greatly benefit from that would make her feel seen and respected. Um, and I think also that might have um, kept her connection to, to God alive. I think um, she, she starts to kind of conflate um, the racism of her church with her religious practice. Um, and so for her, she can't, she, she can't have both. Um, she has to reject the church because of all that it has symbolized. Um, and would she still feel that way if she'd grown up in a black church? I, I don't think so. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an opportunity to kind of compare and contrast those experiences. I read something recently where a woman kind of really kind of made this throwaway statement about how there is no religious left in America. Um, and I was like, that is nonsense. The religious left is the black church um, or the black church is a part of the religious left. Um, and so the kind of interplay between politics and religion um, is one that I think Gifty really, really, she could have, she could have benefited greatly from. Mm. And I'm, I'm thinking of that, like that uh, when Nana asked, uh, the youth counselor or the, the the church youth group leader basically, well, what about like a village in Africa where Christianity was never available? And then he just casually says, oh, they all go to hell too, basically. Yep. <laughs> and it seems like religion for all of the characters in the book, um, it's like, it's just such like this... Um, I don't know, like, I, I feel like obviously the, the question that the book is asking is like, what answers can religion provide for us? But each of the characters have like this very strange relationship to religion, like Gifty obviously um, conflates, you know, the racism of her church with, um, with her religion. Um, Nana, we know, is kind of thrown off after that and, you know, says that, you know, he 
doesn't believe in it anymore. But their mother kind of almost treats it almost like a drug, I would mm. say. I would mm. say Kristen is her drug. Yeah. I don't That's an interesting reading. Yeah, I think her the mother definitely has like an obsession with her religious practice that I think mirrors the obsessions that we see both with Gifty and her work and with Nana and his actual addiction. Um, but the mother also has, she has this, um, and for those listening, I'm calling her the mother because she doesn't have a name in the in the book. She's always called my mother. Um, but she she has she has the benefit of having this foundation in the religion of um, her church in Ghana. Um, she grew up, she lived there, she went to Pentecostal church there. Um, and so I think she can kind of shrug off the ways that she sees religion being practiced at her church in Alabama um, as an American thing, not like as a specific to um, white American thing. Um, and so she she has the benefit, I think, of being able to kind of build off of that early foundation in a way that her kids never get. Like they only see church here. Um, and, and that means something differently to them because of the fact that they um, go to this predominantly white church. Mm. And speaking of kind of the West versus the rest of the world, this is a question from Levon. He asked, oh, this person asked, sorry. How do you navigate pursuing a Black narrative while combating the Western critics' um, quotations, seeming preference of exploiting our trauma to achieve literary acclaim? Mm. That's a good question. I think, I don't know. I think I just have the, a, now I have the benefit of um, being able to write whatever I, I like really without having to worry too much about um, about whether or not I'll be able to, you know, have somebody publish it. And I think that's, that's a consideration that maybe keeps some people from writing what is on their heart to write, um, writing about their home countries in the way that they want to write it. Um, but I think the way that you get past that um, is to is to have this kind of tunnel vision about your work um, and to treat your reader, your imagined audience, as people who can live up and follow um, follow you where you are uh, or like meet you where you are. I think if you are writing with the expectation that you're going to have to explain everything, explain your culture, translate who you are, translate your, your culture to, um, to this other culture, um, then you'll always be writing at, at a deficit. Um, so to go in with the, with the understanding and the hope um, that, that when you write, people will be willing and able to meet you where you are. And then the other thing that I would say is that, you know, the more, um, the more literature we start to see from people of color, people from different backgrounds, um, the, the wider the door gets, um, particularly because the publishing industry relies so heavily on what they call comps, like comparing a book to another book that's already been published. Um, and so if you, if you don't have a comp um, that, that is readily available, then your book might languish. Um, so I think one thing that makes me happy about the books that I have written is that hopefully, um, hopefully the fact that I have gotten the chance to do this means that somebody coming up behind me doesn't have to worry about not having a comp. Sorry, yeah. And that also just reminds me of Toni Morrison. Basically, like, again, like, we live Blackness every day. And mm. I don't think that, um, I don't, I just don't think that there's any way for us, uh, I don't think that, not that there's not any way for us to not center our Blackness, but it is like our reality. Um, we have another question here from Sharon. Do you find that being an author makes it easier to see allegories in otherwise benign circumstances? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, I can't compare it to anything else uh, because I think my, my brain just thinks this way now. I do have like a little file on my phone. Like I use the notes app on my phone very heavily whenever 
I notice something strange happening or something that I feel like um, I feel like might have some other resonance than what is occurring in the actual moment. And so I do think perhaps I'm like more attuned to that kind of thing um, than, um, than people who haven't exercised that muscle. But at the same time, I think it's something that, that anyone can, can do if you start to read a lot um, and start to kind of um, yeah, just pick up on the world around you. When I, when I used to teach, I would always do this exercise with my students where I would have them like go into a public place, um, like a coffee shop or um, a restaurant or just sitting in a, in a soccer game in the audience um, and write down like word for word a conversation that they were hearing, um, overhearing, and then use that conversation to write a little story. Um, and it was always really interesting to see what direction the students took that little snippet. It was often just like two or three sentences. Um, but I think once again, once you start to once you start to exercise that muscle of of seeing something and wondering what you can make of it, um, then then you then you see it everywhere. You hear it everywhere. Um, and it seems like there are folks in the YouTube chat who are interested in home going, um, as we have <laughs> predicted. So <laughs> I guess we can, you know, move into talking a little bit about home going, which was obviously your first novel, um, which for me was such a, um, as a, as a black woman born in America, it, it was such like a validating experience to read about this family who ended up in so many different places, obviously across time, but also across continents, right? Mm -hmm. um, and can you talk a little bit about, you know, that trip that you took to Ghana in which you realized this was something that you really wanted to write about? Sure. Um, so I was a sophomore. I knew that I wanted, in, in college, I knew that I wanted to write a novel um, but I didn't really know what it, it would be about. Um, I applied for this research grant to travel to Ghana with the intention of going to my mother's hometown, um, Abakrampa, which is in the central region of Ghana, um, a place that I hadn't really been to before and just seeing if anything came up for me. Um, nothing did. Uh, and so I was walking around feeling like I had wasted everybody's time and money and faith. And then my friend Stefan, um, who I used to sing with in a, in a group that um, sang music from the African diaspora, really wanted to go see the Cape Coast Castle, um, which I had never been to before. Um, and so we decided to go to the castle. Uh, and we took the tour just that they that they give to anyone who goes. In fact, Obama had been there, I think, the week before. Um, so there was a lot of attention being paid to the castle at this particular time. Um, but we took the tour. And as the tour guide started to talk to us about the fact that the British soldiers who lived and worked in the castle would sometimes marry the local women, um, it felt to me, it felt almost visceral. Like I, I just kind of felt this like jolt, like what? Um, what did these women know about what was going on here? Because of course, then he takes us down to see the dungeons um, and you're standing in that room and I'm not like a super like superstitious person, um, but standing in those dungeons, I think anyone can feel the fact that these places are haunted. Like there's still a lingering smell there's grime on the walls it's so small and claustrophobic um it felt haunted and i thought how could any free gold coast woman be walking above this um either not knowing um or not caring or i didn't know what i didn't know what the situation was but i wanted to write something that that had this kind of upstairs downstairs um scenario in it where you get to see a woman living free up above and a woman down below um who is being kept as an enslaved person um and i i mean i didn't know that they were going to be related i didn't know it was going to cover that many years um it's the only time in my writing life where i felt anything like a stroke of inspiration um I actually went home and wrote in my journal that I was keeping, like my research journal, um, 
that I was scared of how much research this book was going to take. Um, but I felt like I felt like embodied at that moment. Like I knew that I wanted to write about this. Mm. Mm. Oh man, you felt embodied at that moment. I think mm -hmm. I think so many people are like waiting for that moment to hit them. You know what I mean? Yeah. That moment where you know like this is like this is the thing. This yeah. is the thing. And so you talk about all of the research that you had to do. What was it like having to look up all this stuff spanning generations, like generations? How did how did you even begin? Um, well, it was really overwhelming and I was really young. <laughs> and I think I just like dove into it head first without without really thinking about creating a plan. I think if I did it now, knowing myself, I'd be a little bit more careful and meticulous with how I started. But I started really just with a family tree um, that looks a lot like the one that's at the front of the book now except mine also had dates. And then um, maybe like one thing that was happening politically, historically in the background during each time period. Um, so for a character like Kojo, it was the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, for Aquia, it was the Ya Santua War. Um, and then I used those, those moments as jumping off points for conducting the research. So I would really just start by researching the thing um, and then see what story emerged, um, or if I already had a story in mind, think of how to incorporate the research that I was um, that I was reading into um, into the stories. Um, but in some cases, I think like the the story came first, and the research uh, supplemented it. So, like the the first chapter with Afia. Um, after that day in the Cape Coast Castle, I had a pretty clear idea of what her trajectory was going to be. I just wanted research that would help shore it up, um, help keep it, make sure that it was as accurate as possible, though it's a difficult time period to find deeply accurate, um, lots of information about. Um, but then for other, other chapters, other characters, I didn't really know where I was going at all. And the, the research is what led to the story. Um, so I'm thinking of H, um, who comes halfway through, through the novel. Um, and for him, all that I had written on my um, family tree was H, Reconstruction slash Jim Crow. Um, because I knew that that was roughly around the time that he would have been living in. Um, and so I started researching jobs that newly emancipated slaves would have had. Um, and obviously sharecropping came up over and over and over. Um, and I did start writing like a sharecropping story. I just didn't, I wasn't really feeling it. Um, but then I stumbled upon this really great essay article in the Wall Street Journal by Douglas Blackman, and it was called From Alabama's Past, Capitalism Teamed with Racism to Create Cruel Partnership. Um, and it was about a man named Green Cottenham who was arrested for vagrancy and sentenced to work in these coal mines. Um, so it was about convict leasing. And I just went down this rabbit hole um, about convict leasing, uh, a practice that I don't think we hear about nearly enough in this country, though I think it forms the basis um, of a lot of what we see today in terms of mass incarceration. Um, but at any rate, um, I found it so interesting that suddenly the chapter um, emerged from there. Um, so each each chapter was different and the process really depended on how much I knew to begin with. I felt really strongly that I didn't want it to be a like many thousand page novel, though it easily could have been. Um, and I also felt really strongly that I didn't want to spend so many years like obsessing over whether or not somebody would be wearing green shoes in 1754 um, that it like kept me from from writing. Um, so, so I had to kind of balance research with the work of fiction. Um, and for me, what that meant was I would do just enough research to feel like I understood um, the character and the time period. And then I would write the chapter and kind of set the research out of my mind. Um, and that's how I did the first draft. And then each other draft was about refining and making sure 
um, things were as accurate as possible. But the first draft, I wanted to feel um, a kind of freedom to move around even within the constraints of the research. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a comment here from Bridget. Um, she said, at the end of each chapter of Homegoing, I was sad to be done with that person. Your writing is so beautiful. I could have read a complete novel about each one. That's mm -hmm. Bridget, you're so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> and so um, we're coming up on about 15 minutes left. Um, I do want to ask another audience question because I know you guys have been waiting. Um, Lydia asks, what do you want to highlight in terms of older generations having an incorrect, me incorrect mental health image? So obviously talking about um, Gifty's mother in Transcendent. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if I had thought about it in terms of older generation versus younger generations, though I'm sure there is a bit of that at play um, in terms of how Gifty's mother was raised to think about um, to think about mental health versus the the messaging that Gifty is getting um, at her age, um, but I suppose if there if there is anything that I that I want to highlight, it is the fact that there um, is nothing to be ashamed of. Um, there's there's nothing wrong that the brain is an organ like your heart, um, and and like a heart, it can um, it can suffer, it can fall ill. Um, and, and there's no shame in that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my message. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is even after Gifty is doing all this work, I mean, I haven't gotten to the end yet, but it's still like, she doesn't have an answer. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? There is no answer, um, mm -hmm. to things like that. And that goes into the next question about Nana and, um, his addiction. Can you talk about your approach for having Nana's death be related to the opioid epidemic? Um, do you expect more fiction to touch on this crisis in the future? I know here in Boston, we have a very bad um, opioid epidemic right now in our city. So it mm -hmm. seems like a pertinent question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, re the research came first. So I was thinking about addiction broadly, um, but the reason that I wanted to focus on um, opioid usage in particular was because of the opioid epidemic that we are still in, um, though obviously it's being kind of subsumed into the pandemic um, when we think about science and, um, and health. Um, but at the time that I was researching this book, there was so, there were so many really incredible um, essays and articles coming out around, um, around this crisis um, investigative journalism that was tackling the role of the pharmaceutical companies in creating this this crisis, um, but there were also these really really beautifully rendered, um, just like uh, kind of human interest stories and documentaries. And I felt like there was just a wealth of information about the lives of people who were encountering um, who were encountering opioid opioids either because they were themselves addicted or because they uh, were firefighters who were first responding or because they had family members. Um, but the thing that I felt like was missing in a lot of these pieces um, was the race aspect. And one of the reasons I think that we are seeing this shift toward a more humanizing view of um, people who suffer from opioid use disorder is because this epidemic is largely now um, rural, white, suburban, um, whereas the previous epidemic of heroin and crack were largely black and urban. Um, and so I wanted to write a novel that had a black character at the center who was experiencing this um, and still treat it as the health crisis that it is um, but also still imbue the story with as much um, dignity and respect um, as, as anyone suffering from this deserves, um, rather than the overwhelming uh, narrative that it's something to be criminalized that we see um, when we see Black people suffering. Um, so, so yeah, it was, it was many things at once, but mostly about the fact that I was encouraged 
by the fact that we were seeing so many um, turns toward talking about addiction as a healthcare crisis, um, but troubled by the fact that it felt like we were leaving Black people out of that conversation. Right. Um, and I think the saddest part about Nana was that, you know, his addiction stemmed from like the over prescription of Oxycontin. Right. Um, and can you talk um, about like why you kind of decided to go that um, that way with with his addiction story? Mm. Well, that just felt like the natural progression for him because of the fact that he was an athlete. Um, and I was trying to think of ways that he might encounter um, opioids for the first time. And I think this is the way that a lot of athletes who end up becoming addicted to um, opioids uh, come in contact with it. Um, so really it was kind of Nana's um, athleticism that came first. Um, but again, yes, there were a lot of really, really interesting pieces coming out around the role of the pharmaceutical companies in creating this crisis. And I wanted to, to highlight that as well. Mm. Um, this question is from Phoebe and um, they ask, do you notice any through line intentional or otherwise in your writing or do you have some larger theme that connects your work? Yes, I do notice a through line. Um, I know that lots of people, lots of reviewers and people reading the books um, have been talking about the fact that Homegoing and Transcendent Kingdom are really different. Um, but one of the things that I think connect these two books is the question of um, what trauma does to a family, um, what it means to have this kind of um, this central trauma that began beyond you, began generations before you that you still have to deal with. Um, and so in this case, we see it on a much more intimate scale. Obviously, in Homegoing, I'm talking about slavery and colonialism as these traumatic events that affect um, these two families. But in this case, it's, it's more intimate, it's smaller, um, but it's, it's no less affecting for Gifty, the fact that her, that her, mother, um, that her mother fell ill um, with depression when she was a child and that her brother died. Um, and she is carrying, she is carrying the weight, I think, of her mother's incapacity um, to, to take care of her um, when she was young. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that I'm interested in. How do we make sense of a world in which senseless things happen? How do we make meaning out of our lives? Um, how do we continue to, to strive, to struggle, to raise our children, to have healthy relationships um, when when we have suffered these wounds in the past. Yeah, and um, that reminds me of um, like uh, Gifty describing her mother as like a callus and then it's like, well, why is the callus there? Yeah. You know, the conditions for it. Um, this last question is from Scott because we only got about five minutes left. Um, Oh, this one's so nice. Uh, my wife and I teach homegoing to sophomores. What is one aspect of the book you'd want high schoolers to learn or think about? Oh, that's so amazing. Well, thank you, Scott and your wife for teaching the book. That means a lot to me. Um, I think the thing that, that I most want people to take away from homegoing, particularly young people, um, is the fact that History is not this discrete thing that happens and then ends um, and has no bearing on the rest of the rest of uh, time. Um, that that everything that we see in the present has its roots in things that happened long before us. Um, and so, to to put the present in context isn't just um, isn't just like an act of um, of awareness, it's it's actually an act that leads toward leads towards justice. Once you start to realize um, that we we don't exist in a timeless um, in a timeless unit, um, I think that's when you really start doing some of the interesting and hard work of figuring out how to make things better. Mm, 
Yes. And I think this is a season that we're all concentrating on breaking those ancestral curses, yep. dealing with a lot of that ancestral trauma. It is very real, guys, and you're going to have to handle it at some point um, as Gifty finds out in Transcendent Kingdom. Um, and I think those are all of the audience questions. We've got about four minutes left, guys. So if you've got a question, um, try to submit it in right now. Um, but I am going to let you guys know that, again, if you haven't gotten Transcendent Kingdom yet, you can pick up a copy at Porter Square Books for 20% off. Again, you don't want to miss out on that because books are pricey, y'all. They're, they're real pricey. <laughs> and, you know, you better jump on this while you can. And um, I think we have one last comment. Oh, someone joined us from France, um, Mathilde. Uh, I probably did not say that right. Uh, this person said, I enjoyed home going a lot. I learned so much. I agree, your writing is beautiful and I cannot wait to discover Transcendent Kingdom. Oh, that's so kind, thank you. Thank you, Mathilde. Um, and thank you to everyone out there who has joined us for tonight. Um, again, uh, I just want to thank Ya for uh, taking the time out to have this conversation. Um, we're just so appreciative of you and your work um, and just how you tell Black stories. So thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Ariel. And thank, uh, thanks to everybody who joined us. Again, make sure to follow WBUR City Space on YouTube. Um, there is one event that is going down that I think everybody out there should join. Um, and it is later this month, the BU Initiative on Cities and BU Diversity Inclusion. They're going to be hosting the third installment of their Black Boston series. Um, and you guys definitely should check this out. It's called Changing the Face of Politics, and it's a discussion on Black political leadership in Greater Boston. So um, Kimberly Atkins, who is now the senior opinion writer at the Boston Globe, will be hosting with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, Representative Nika El Guardo, and also Boston City Councilor Andrea. Campbell. And um, to find out more, all you have to do is go to wbur.org slash city space. And I think that is it. Um, thank you guys so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Yeah.